Good afternoon, I'm uh, John Kreiling from Nelson Mandela University. I'm gonna to talk to you about using unplugged activities and a mobile app to introduce foundation phase learners to coding. Just a disclaimer, when I submitted the abstract, I was hoping that we would have more or less a, a normal second semester in which we could roll out some of these activities in schools, but that didn't really happen. So my empirical research, unfortunately, didn't happen when, as planned in June. But I think I still have a story to tell, hopefully. Uh, so the question is, why unplugged coding, specifically in the African context? I don't know how many of you remember this photo of Richard Okoto from Ghana, when he drew out the word, uh, uh, Microsoft Word screen on his blackboard to teach his learners computer literacy. And he became famous, uh, that photo went viral and he received laptops and PCs from all over the world. And it's very encouraging to see this obviously. And to see him in class teaching his learners now on laptops where literally a few weeks before that they had no computers. But the question now I want to ask is, is this really the way to help uh, learners from Africa over the digital divide or introduce them to coding? And I'm gonna try and answer that question now. The, the concept of the digital divide, I, I'm using the analogy of, of a, a river with learners that are having to pass the river to, to school. That's photos you very often see across our continent. And what Richard is doing with these class kind of is what this adult is doing with one learner, carrying uh, across a river to get to school. But let, before we carry on with the story, let's look at what the challenges are facing computer education in Kenyan schools. And let's be honest, this is probably all over Africa. Lack of computers, dysfunctional laboratories, expensive computers, lack of electricity, lack of internet, lack of qualified teachers, teacher intimidation. That means teachers are being intimidated by technology and security. This was identified in Kenya but my travels in South Africa tells me it's very similar in our country. So where Richard can carry one person across the river, it's impossible to carry thousands across the river. And that's why I'm saying uh, a solution that needs computers on our continent to get learners across the digital divide does not have a big enough footprint to have an impact on the vast majority of our learners. So this cannot be a solution. Although it's nice, it's good that some learners have, have exposure to laptops and PCs. In South Africa, 16,000 schools don't have any computers and any labs. And I cannot see them getting any in the near future. So that brings me to unplugged coding. And it's not something that we developed. Obviously, for those who know, it's a well-known term across the world. Um, and the objectives of our Unplugged Coding project. Now, I just want to state here, I know that using cell phones is not really unplugged, but we put it under this umbrella because we see it's much more accessible and less expensive than computer laboratories. So we're saying we don't want to need computers. We don't want to need electricity. We don't want to need internet. We need very basic teacher training. It must be fun. There must be a low budget intervention, but we're not allowed to compromise on quality. And without going through that list from Kenya, if one goes through them one by one, these objectives of unplugged coding addresses all of these issues. Uh, uh, we're trying to build computer labs in each school across the continent is never gonna happen. So, We've, we've done some work on that. what are the, the best unplugged ways to get learners taught programming. Now, the first important thing that we need to teach people is what is a program? It's a list of instructions. And the best way that I found to start, and I've done training all across the country with about a thousand teachers, is to introduce them to the games that kids play. And these are only two, Hopscotch, which is clearly a list of instructions, and if you watch, clearly watch how people do uh, rope skipping, uh, they definitely apply some loops. There's some repetition and pattern. So these are good examples of how you could introduce to learners the basic concept of what a program is. Uh, this is another activity which we've built into our course, 
where you use a chair, a shoe, and a person, and the learner needs to respond to the different commands, which then also become a list of instructions. On the right hand side is a, is a great R class in Mtata in the Eastern Cape being introduced to coding. And then I found that some of the more uh, enthusiastic teachers even went on to Pinterest. This is in a less uh, resource school in, in Koberga, where they have 40 learners attending a coding club twice a week in the afternoons. And the teacher went on to Pinterest and found some problem solving activities before she introduced coding. Our flagship tool, which is not for foundation phase, but I thought I should quickly show it to you, is the Tanks coding app, which was developed in 2017. And using this app, we've reached around 25,000 learners across South Africa. And the kits have been distributed to probably about three, 400 schools across our continent, uh, across South Africa. The following video will quickly just show you the mechanism. So in this scenario, the tank needs to move backwards, turn left, and then move forward twice. So the learner packs out the code using the puzzle pieces, takes a photo of the code. When happy that it's the correct puzzle pieces that were recognized, you press yes and your tank moves. There's a very relatively inexpensive way to teach learners coding. Uh, and for those who know coding, we do some of the loops, the for loop, the while loop, nested constructs. It goes up to 35 levels and becomes very complex. I always say after 30 years of teaching, coding, it took me 90 minutes to solve the second last level. So there's quite a complex uh, introduction of coding concepts that happens while the kids play the game. Our Rangers game is of similar complexity, but it has an additional game poaching theme. And then we have boats, and that's what I want to focus on today. That is aims at the foundation phase learners, grade R to grade three. It has very basic commands, uh, move forward, move backwards, turn left, turn right. And you move a, a boat across a grid on your screen, trying to remove plastic type tokens from the screen. So it has a marine pollution theme as well. You toggle on your screen the commands and then you click and you can see your boat move. This all happens on the screen. And once you've removed a, a plastic from the ocean, the learner gets a multiple choice question on marine pollution as well as solar energy. And there's all a tip on what they can do to address these environmental issues. It also allows for virtual tournaments and we've had up to a thousand learners from across the country participating from home, especially effective during COVID. We've developed resources, which covers 10 um, coding topics all of these unplugged, very little actually interacting with the app. It's mainly uh, activities that teachers can do in class to introduce some of the coding concepts like um, the debugging or algorithms or sequencing. Um, so it's a very, and it's all cost effective. You don't need to buy anything expensive except for the kit, which is around uh, 3000 Rand and a school only needs one. But then we also introduce, we encourage the teachers, even before they get busy in the classroom or even before they go to the app, to go out into the physical world where they also do the basic forward and turn left, turn right commands uh, in different ways. And this is one of the other lessons where the kids need to work out a little algorithm to sort rubbish as plastic or food waste or tin and metal. So it's a very hands-on practical way to think in terms of algorithms of abstraction and problem solving. We realize that coding is not just algorithms, it's design thinking, it's digital citizenship and computational thinking. And we're busy now developing 40 lessons that will cover all four of these topics. And if you go and look at the current curriculum, uh, draft curriculum, it covers probably 80% of the different concepts in the current curriculum, but these are all unplugged. For the problem solving, we've developed a little storybook on solar power. And in, during the story, there's a little, uh, quite a few activities where the learners need to solve problems and think up solutions. We've had training with teachers. Um, as I said, we trained about a thousand teachers. Of this was um, 
15 physical sessions all across South Africa and one in Vintuk. And remember, I said the training needs to be unintimidating. So I found that when the teachers arrive there, they are really scared of this concept of technology and coding and computers. But after four to five hours of, of real fun training, this is a generic feedback that we get. Immediately they say that code has been demystified. Uh, they know that they don't need tech. So many of these teachers came from schools that have no technology. They somehow immediately click how they can integrate it into their maths class or languages or whatever. They leave there with self-confidence, which to me is very critical. I've seen some of these teachers come from Python or web development uh, workshops where they don't leave with self-confidence. They know where to start. And because they enjoy the sessions, we have a lot of fun in those five hours, they know that their learners will enjoy. Um, so coming back to the uh, digital divide and crossing the river, I honestly believe that for, for Africa and then specifically for South Africa, uh, we cannot rely on computer laboratories and expensive com robots and 3D printers we have to find a way to reach the millions that will never have that tools. So in this, I think we found the bridge across the river. The Coding Game Rangers was developed to introduce learners to coding without the use of computers. But it goes much further than just introducing learners to coding. It also teaches them soft skills like group work, communication, strategy, problem solving. So what we do is we use a few cell phones and some customized tokens visit schools where the learners then play for 45 minutes to an hour and during these workshops they introduce to coding but we can also see the dynamics of group work. This can also take the form of a coding club at schools where schools can run this weekly or daily without needing fancy and expensive computer laboratories. We've added to this game the concept of game poaching and they literally have to try and save the rhino by catching the game poacher before the game poacher gets to the rhino. They also get information about game poaching in Africa. This way they are informed on environmental issues on our continent. Thank you very much. This is a photo very close to my heart. It was taken in Soweto. And if you have time to watch the body language, you'll see problem solving, you'll see communication, you'll see strategy, uh, and you'll see involvement which to me is much better than seeing a bunch of foundation phase kids behind computers in a laboratory. That's all from my side. Uh, I'm open for questions or comments. Your chairperson of the session. My name is Lelo M.E. As you have indicated there, I am a master student here in the University of Limpopo. And I'll be sharing my paper with you titled the fourth industrial revolution as a fuel to higher education's accessibility in South Africa, challenges and opportunities. Well, I think there's a point of departure. Uh, education is a precondition to achieve sustainable economic uh, growth and development. So any country that does not invest heavily in education is risking its um, economic um, status. So, but there are two things that a country can do to improve their economic situations. They can invest in education or in the health sector. But now I'm focusing specifically to the uh, to, to education as as a, as a, a means to achieve um, a, a economic growth and development. Now, to achieve such a transformation, uh, there is a need to um, incorporate the 4IR so that we are able to improve the accessibility of um, higher, educations, uh, higher education uh, using the 4IR or Fourth Industrial Revolution tools. So access to education uh, lies on a variety of factors, including the, uh, the modes in which the education is offered. One such a mode is using the digital platforms so that students and lecturers can be able to access education online from the comfort of their, their homes. So 
Currently, the advent of COVID-19 pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, revealed that there is a wide gap uh, between the advantaged and disadvantaged South African institutions of higher learning in terms of education accessibility through the 4IR. Of a particular interest in this paper, I'm trying to, I mean, is, is a, a poor or inadequate analysis of the 4IR technologies such as the 5G, digital learning, the Internet of Things, which are currently positions, positioned as available tools that can be used to access education. So according to the, to the I mean, according to the paper draws its inspiration from the current discourse about the 4IR in South Africa. Now, some institutions of high learning in South Africa, such as University of Pretoria, Johannesburg, Cape Town, amongst others, they've always enjoyed the advantages of using the modern technology so that education can easily be accessible to students and lecturers. Now, on the other hand, the so-called disadvantaged universities, that is University of Limpopo, University of Vanda, Forte, amongst others, they are now compelled because of the pandemic to consider you know, using the four art tools so that they are able to enhance the education's accessibility to, to the students and the lecturers. Ladies and gentlemen, this paper is a conceptual intervention and it adopts um, a literature-based methodology to analyze theoretically the accessibility of education with particular interest in the challenges and opportunities of the four IR technologies in South African or South Africa's higher education. Now, along with appreciating the current prominence of the four IR in fueling, in fueling accessibility of higher education, this paper also highlights the challenges and opportunities, like I said. It attempts to theoretically close the gap, the, the gap in literature with regard to the accessibility of disadvantaged higher educational institutions. Uh, using the, the elements of 4IR. Now, let me take you through the analysis or brief analysis of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, the 4IR refers to the use of, I mean, to the use of elements such as the, the Internet of Things, the IoT, robotics, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, nanotechnology, 5G amongst others, and cyber, the physical systems. Now, any educational strategy for the four IR should be based on the outcomes of the, the three IR, the third industrial revolution, which include the emergence of blended, blended online and, and teaching, the reliable and faster integration of global and, uh, I mean, global video, as well as a wide range of automated education services. While the 4IR may be a petrifying phenomena, its benefits cannot be ignored, ladies and gentlemen. Such benefits include enhancing the effectiveness and the efficiency of existing um, education, easing or, I mean, ease the cost or the load of work, amongst others. These are some of the benefits of the 4IR in terms of um, or looking at the uh, higher education institutions. Now, the uh, Shava and Office now indicates that while the anticipated uh, benefits of the, uh, the 4IR, that is to enhance the effectiveness and efficiency, it also bears some significant uh, challenges in terms of um, higher education uh, institutions. Now, let me take you through the accessibility of education looking at the fourth industrial revolution, the tools of the 4IR, which are currently gaining a momentum both in, in, in South Africa and globally. Uh, the, the United States of America, USA, um, China, and, and India, they've already, they are in the, more advanced stage in terms of using the four IR tools uh, uh, so that education can be accessible to students and the, and the lecturers. So the use of websites, Blackboard, and other online or digital platforms that have been used in the United States of America, China, and India um, for the purpose of accessibility of higher education. Now, 
in South African or in a South African, uh, South African context, the University of South Africa is such an example where they've always used their traditional method of you know, open distance learning using the, the internet so that they are able to facilitate their teaching and learning. So this initiative by UNISA, it has influenced or motivated a lot of universities in South Africa to adopt the, the current, um, uh, I mean, the, the momentum of using the four IR tools. So the recent developments, I mean, now I'm, I'm talking about the opportunities created by the fourth industrial revolution in terms of education. The recent development of the 4IR cannot be sidelined because it defines and shapes how the, the, the institutions of higher learning should uh, improve their teaching and learning as well as to be accessible to all the, the students. Now, the, 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 there is currently a debate on the issues of 5G. It is very important in this paper because the 5G will enable students and lecturers to easily or uh, to easily log into the internet and without any problems of poor internet connections. Now, it is very much important that the 5G be uh, included in this paper because it ensures the, the, the accessibility of higher education. And it will speed up some connections there so that learning can be well understood, it can be simple. Because the 5G will also enable the smooth connections of e-learning and participation in the academic access, uh, assessments with fewer network challenges. Now, the digital teaching and learning and internet of things, they are also part of the opportunities that are created by the 4IR because this, these elements, they are um, perhaps condensed together to facilitate the teaching and learning um, in, the, in, in the universities in South Africa. Uh, the ICT is one of the main drivers towards, the, towards accessing higher education. Internet of, Internet of Things basically talks to the, the way that internet is, can be used to deliver or facilitate facilitate teaching and learning. There is currently a debate that the disadvantaged institutions of higher learning in South Africa must adopt the open distance learning, just like UNISA, um, to render their ed educational assessments online. So the open distance learning is a concept that emerged to ensure, I mean, yeah, to ensure solace to preoccupy the students and lecturers who sees it as flexible regardless of physical environment. So now students are no longer going to struggle to access education. They can do that from the comfort of their, of their homes. So the ODL, ladies and gentlemen, is facilitated by the current emergence of digital tools such as Zoom that we're using now, Google Meet, Skype, and other tools there, and, and, and Blackboard amongst others. Let me take you through the challenges of the 4IR in terms of ed education. The, let, uh, the student challenges, ladies and gentlemen, some of the students from poor background, they are suffering from poor network connections. They, they, there is a family feud in the family. You cannot study very well because of, you know, many people uh, at home. Sometimes some students do not understand where this digital learning is, is a problem for, for, for other students. And there's a problem now in South Africa, the, the problem of electricity, load shedding, which, which uh, could actually be a negative aspect to, to the students in terms of learning. The, the higher educational challenges, you know, the, this one talks to the disadvantaged institutions that, such as University of Mpopo Forte, University of Vendam, with poor or inadequate ICT um, infrastructure. We, we have seen these institutions struggling to roll out online learning this year. Registering was a problem because of poor ICT. And some of the lecturers do not understand where well. they're old. They do not understand the very well these things of online teaching and learning. So it's a, it, it, it became a challenge for other institutions. Five minutes. So, 
Thanks, thanks very much. To, to incorporate open distance learning or online learning into the, um, uh, in, in the universities. This paper, ladies and gentlemen, say it adopted a literature-based methodology like I've highlighted. I've, I've, I've collected data using um, a desktop study because it's, it, it is a theoretical paper and I've analyzed my data using a content analysis which has enabled me to develop some themes and um, define or describe some of those themes. So the effectiveness and profit, profitability of higher education system could be improved by adopting the 4IR for both students and lecturers. Although there is um, a, a debate about the digital divide between the poor students and the, the students who are advanced in terms of technology. The government in South Africa, they have tried to put resources to fund students to provide some laptops. Universities have provided data to, to those students who are struggling so that they embrace this new phenomena of the four IR uh, into their culture of teaching and learning so that they shift. They do not necessarily move, they shift or integrate their traditional way of teaching, which is contact learning with the, this day, with the online learning. They just integrate them, they use both the systems of traditional and, and, and online. However, this new trend and culture of digital learning can be can enable and sustain teaching and learning. Even post COVID nineteen context, we will still use these uh, tools of uh, learning online. Therefore, this paper, ladies and gentlemen, concludes that the four IR technologies must be embraced in all areas of learning in higher educational institutions, particularly for the disadvantaged. Uh, teaching learning so that we move with times because technology is not static it it changes every time so that will be the end of my paper ladies and gentlemen with a quote by napoleon bonaparte who once said religion is what keeps the poor from murdering the rich uh, chairperson of the session thank you very much that was the brief uh, presentation of my paper good afternoon I am Dr. Shanae van Adlende, a senior lecturer from the School of Computer Science and Information Systems at the Northwest University in South Africa. My co-author is Mrs. Molly Ziaman. Today we will be presenting our research based on the perceptions on an extended program in computer science at the South African University. Northwest University introduced a BSc IT extended curriculum program in 2010 to offer more students the opportunity to obtain an academic qualification in the field of computer science. This paper provides background on how extended curriculum programs were established in South Africa and a brief explanation of the structure of the extended program that was introduced at the Northwest University. A qualitative research approach was conducted to gain an understanding of the perceptions of students and lecturers on the BSc IT extended curriculum program. In the fields of science, mathematics and technology, the gap between the level of skills and knowledge learners obtain during their school career and those required in higher education is a matter of concern. In South Africa, inadequate schooling was offered to black, colored and Indian communities for many years in the apartheid era. Therefore, the few students from these communities who were allowed to enroll at higher education institutions in South Africa found it difficult to complete their studies, specifically in the science-related fields. Some intervention was required to meet the demands of higher education. As a result, bridging academic programs emerged at higher education institutions in South Africa in the 1980s and were later replaced by foundation programs. 
Foundation programs are defined as special programs for students whose prior learning has been adversely affected by educational or social inequalities. Foundation programs are aimed at improving knowledge and skills in specific fields of study. Extended curriculum programs are offered over a period of one year as an introduction to the specific program the student is enrolled for. A student enrolling for an extended curriculum program would therefore complete a standard three-year program within four years. The additional first year of study contains a selection of modules in an introductory level as preparation for the following years of study comprising of standard programming modules. Since extended curriculum programs have been introduced, more learners have been provided the opportunity to further their studies at higher education institutions. A need for an extended curriculum program in computer science was identified at the Northwest University based on the fact that students who apply for enrollment in the standard BSc IT program often do not meet the minimum requirements with an APS score of 26 and a math mark above 50%. Also, students who do not meet the minimum requirements often do not complete their BSc IT program in the minimum period of three years. The BSc IT Extended Curriculum Program extends the standard BSc IT program by one year, with the following modules presented during the first year of study and during the first semester of the second year. The, these modules include Introduction to Problem Solving, Mathematical Techniques 1 and 2, Introductory Programming Principles, Introduction to Graphical User Interface Programming and Object-Oriented Programming. In order to ensure the success of the BSc IT Extended Curriculum Program, there was a need to obtain insight into the perceptions of students and lecturers on the program. In the next section, the research methodology for the study is discussed. The objective of this paper was to understand the perception students and lecturers have about the BSc IT Extended Curriculum Program offered at, at the South African University. Students who were enrolled for the BSc IT Extended Curriculum Program and in their second, third or fourth year of study were invited to participate. Additionally, BSc IT Honor students who completed their BSc IT Extended Program were also invited. From the group of students who were invited, 13 students in their third year of study, 4 students in their fourth year of study, and 3 students from the Honors Program accepted the invitation and participated in the study. We also asked lecturers to participate and we asked lecturers who had more than 10 years of experience and six lecturers participated in the study. The student interview questions entailed questions asking about their initial perception current perception, challenges encountered, and valuable modules. Questions posed to lecturers included questions about positive aspects as well as negative aspects of the extended curriculum program and the most important factors that contribute to the success of the extended curriculum program. Conventional or undirected content analysis was used to analyze the data, which entails that the number of times a code was used was counted and codes were formed from the researchers' interests. More specifically, the process suggested by Zhang and Voldemort 
was used and is provided in this table. The students' interviews were transcribed and coded and the various steps of Zhang and Wildemar were followed. The main themes listed here have been extracted. Basically, it entails the initial perceptions, perceptions currently, challenges experienced and valuable aspects of the extended curriculum program. Initially, students were excited and optimistic about improving their programming skills. Some were unsure about the content and others were apprehensive about the duration of their studies. Current perceptions of students that already completed the extended year says that the extended program prepared them for the standard program. Students also said that it was enjoyable and that they feel that they outperformed the other students in the standard program. Students encountered challenges such as being afraid to ask questions, programming being a difficult skill to learn, as well as time management. Students found the lecturing style of the extended curriculum program lecturers valuable. They also felt that adaption to the standard program was easy and that the program increased their confidence. The module contents were also valuable. Codes that emerged from lecturer interviews included positive and negative aspects as well as success factors. Five positive aspects highlighted by lecturers include that students received an opportunity to study where they might not have been able to. Lecturers also felt that students were well prepared for the standard program and that special attention is given to students in the extended curriculum program. It is their opinion that students are more mature when they enter the standard program. Negative aspects according to lecturers include the perception that students might get too much assistance. And on the other hand, that students that are here because of a low math mark might be bored with the programming because they might actually be really good at programming already. This normally happens when some students had programming as a subject at school but did not perform well in their mathematics. The most important success factors according to the lecturers include the focus on fundamental concepts, small number of numbers of students and student commitment. In this paper, we also suggest factors for the implementation of a successful BSc IT extended curriculum program. The two main factors are content and teaching and learning. In terms of content, the extended curriculum program should support the content on the standard program and it should address fundamental knowledge and skills needed for the standard program. In terms of teaching, the characteristics of lecturers in the extended curriculum program mentioned in interviews by participants include being dedicated, approachable, patient, experienced in subject matter and experienced in good teaching practices. In terms of the lecturing style, the lecturers should have an adaptable pace of work provide thorough explanations, make time for repetition of work and provide enough individual attention. In terms of learning, the work pace should be manageable for students that struggle with concepts. Classes should be small so that enough individual attention can be provided and student commitment to engage in the learning process. 
This concludes our reporting of our research project about the perceptions of students and lecturers about a BSc IT Extended Curriculum program presented at the Northwest University. Thank you. Do you have any questions?